Well, my friends, if you have Bibles, I would invite you to open them to 3 John in the New Testament. If you would like to use a Bible and don't have one, there are ones in the seats in front of you. I would invite you to open to 3 John at the end of the New Testament. And if you are using a smartphone, a tablet, anything like that, I invite you to open to 3 John in the New Testament. Because as you've seen, we've been going through a series this December called Christmas Card from Heaven. And we're asking, if you were to receive a Christmas card from heaven, what would be in it? How would you feel as you read what was in it? And what would you do in response? And we've said that we believe this letter of 3 John, that it contains the themes, it contains the kind of things that we think God might include in a Christmas card if he were to send one out to us today. And we've seen in the previous weeks the theme of love. We've seen in the previous weeks the theme of joy that God might include. And as we look at our verses today, we see something a little bit different, but something that fits very well with the season that we're in. Because as Americans, we're fairly seasonal people. There are certain times of year where we just turn our minds to different things. And so soon, January is going to come around, New Year's is going to be coming around, and we're going to start turning our mind towards resolutions and things we want to see different in the next year. And if we're honest, for many of us, we're going to turn our minds towards health and fitness goals. And there's going to be three weeks in January where you cannot get a treadmill in the gym, is what's going to happen. Because we're going to turn our minds to goals at that time of year, in that season. But then that's going to pass, and we're going to start coming up on summer and warm weather, and some of you are going to start turning your minds to thinking about where you want to go on vacation. Where are you going to get away to? When are you going to leave? What's it going to look like? Or if you're on a more modest budget, you're just going to think about grilling all the time. You're going to eat all the burgers in the summer, present company included. And then we get a little later in the year and we get Thanksgiving and it's this great day and our minds turn to what are we thankful for. And maybe your family has the tradition where you go around the table and you say all the things you're thankful for. And so we have this day where our minds turn towards being thankful. And then the next day we forget all of that and we go out on Black Friday and we buy a whole bunch of new stuff. Right? And our minds turn to Christmas shopping and to getting those kind of things. And then we get into the Christmas season. And for many people, our minds turn towards acts of charity, towards asking, what can I do to make my world better? What can I do to make my little community better? And so you go to the stores, and now they have the Salvation Army Santas ringing the bells. Or you go to the grocery stores, and they have the Toys for Tots bins, and people are giving toys for those who don't have the ability to get toys for themselves. And I even remember growing up, I don't remember charity being a huge part of my family, but I remember there was a Christmas where there was someone my mom worked with and they couldn't afford to get presents for their kids. And so my mom took us out on a shopping trip and we bought a bunch of presents to give to this family so they would have something to give to their kids. Because this time of year, many of our minds start turning to the question, how can I make my world a little bit better? And we get wisdom for that in our verses today. We can learn from these verses tangible things that you can do to make your world a better place. And so we're going to look at that today, and we're going to see three things in that. We're going to see what you can do to make your world better. And then we're going to see how you can do it. And then we're going to see why to do it. So we're going to see what you can do to make your world a better place. We're going to see how you can do it, and we're going to see why to do it. Well, we get the first one of those. We get the what can you do to make your world a better place, beginning in verse 5. Because in verse 5, it says, Beloved, that's Gaius, that's the main recipient of this letter. It says, Gaius, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are. And that should raise the question for us, what is Gaius doing and who are these strangers? What's he doing and who are these strangers? Verse 6 doesn't help. It says, they testified to your love before the church, and you do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. But we still have this question, who are they and what did Gaius do for them? And what we're going to see is that these strangers would have been men traveling to tell people about who Jesus was, what Jesus did, and what Jesus is doing. In other words, they would have been missionaries. These strangers would have been missionaries, and what Gaius did was most likely opened his home so that they could come in. See, if we look at verse 7, it helps us see that, because it says, for they, the strangers, have gone out for the sake of the name accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Now, we know what name this is. This would have been the name of Jesus. 
See, John was one of the first followers of Jesus. And in the New Testament book of Acts, we read about a time when he and another follower of Jesus named Peter were brought before a Jewish council that had just ordered Jesus to be crucified and now had concerns about what men like John and Peter were doing. And so they're standing before this council, and John would have been there when Peter said these words recorded in the book of Acts in chapter 4, where he said, For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, The stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. God has given, key phrase, no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. And so when John, the human author of 3 John, is writing in verse 7, they've gone out for the sake of the name, we know that that name would have been Jesus. They've gone out for the sake of the name of Jesus. And we know what that means, that they've gone out as well. Because near the end of his time on earth in a human body, Jesus gathered his disciples and he said these words to them. These come at the end of Matthew in chapter 28. He said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Will you read verse 19 with me? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And if disciple is a word that you don't quite have vocabulary for, the closest thing we have that we still use today would maybe be protege. Disciple is a better word, but that's the idea. Go and make protégés, others who follow me and live like me. Do that, and then verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So these strangers have gone out for the name of Jesus in order to make disciples of all nations, to lead others to know Jesus, to know God's love through Jesus, and to live a kind of life following Jesus, living in the way that he would set out. And so we now know who the strangers are, but what did Gaius do for them? And then we're going to look at how that ties into how you can make your world a better place, what you can do to make your world a better place. Because see, verse 7 tells us these guys are missionaries, but also that they've gone out accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Now, Gentiles just meant non-Jewish people. But in this context, what it meant is they're going out and they're teaching and they're instructing, and they're not seeking compensation from those they're teaching and instructing. In the ancient world, you had a full profession of traveling teachers, traveling speakers, who would go around and they were entertainment, they were educational, think maybe something like a TED Talk, and they would be compensated for coming and speaking. And so what we're being told here is these guys aren't doing that. They're not going out and sharing this message in order to make a living. They're doing it in order for others to know Jesus and to live as his disciples. But that poses a problem because now you travel far from home, you travel from the places where you had food, from the places where you had support, and how do you make ends meet? Where do you sleep? How do you eat? And what happened in the early church is as these men would travel along, there would be faithful followers of Jesus who would say, you come into my home and I will feed you and I will clothe you and I will supply all that you need while you're here. And that might be a week, that might stretch into years. And so what Gaius has done is he's opened his home to these strangers, these brothers, these missionaries who are coming to make disciples of Jesus. And we're told in verse 8 that we ought to support people like these because in doing that, we may be fellow workers for the truth. What we're being told there is by Gaius supporting these men these traveling Christians who are working to make disciples for Jesus, that he himself is participating in the work of making disciples for Jesus. And so as we put it all together, what we learn about Gaius is that by showing hospitality to these traveling missionaries, he's participating in the work of making disciples for Jesus. And I want you to see how favorably that's viewed in this passage. See, take a look in verses 5 through 8 at just all the places where this is celebrated. Verse 5, it is a faithful thing you do for these brothers. Verse 6, you do well to send them on their journey. Verse 8, we ought to support people like this. In just these short verses, it's crammed full of these words where it's like John is saying, Gaius, you're doing the right thing. 
this is exactly what you should be doing, participating in the work of making disciples for Jesus. And so as we ask, what can we be doing to make our worlds better? What can you be doing to make your world better? An answer we can learn from 3 John is to make disciples for Jesus. You can make your world better by making disciples for Jesus. Now, it may be that you're sitting there thinking, okay, that sounds good, that sounds great. Some of you are sitting there and you've been missionaries, you are missionaries, and you're like, heck yeah, I'm on board. But others of you, you're hearing that and you're going, man, there's a lot of problems in the world right now. There's a lot of really big problems. And maybe you're going, there's even a lot of really big problems in my world right now. And you're saying, is making disciples of Jesus really the best use of my time for seeing these problems addressed and making my world better? Now, you can already guess the answer is absolutely, but the question is why? What makes that the answer? And we could go through history, and we could look at how historically it was early Christians who would go out and who would grab babies left on the side of the road in the Roman Empire before they were taken and put into brothels to be raised to be prostitutes. Early Christians would go and adopt these women into their families. Or we could look at how the concept of hospitals came about because in Roman cities when plagues would hit and everybody would leave, early Christians, early disciples of Jesus would stay in the cities and they would gather these people who were going to die from disease and they would bring them into hospice care and care for them. Except when these people started to receive care, they started to get better. And so it was out of early Christians providing hospice care that the concept of hospitals came into being. And we could look at how it was early, it was Christians who drove the effort to end the African slave trade. We could look at how it was the Christian gospel driving the civil rights movement in our own country. We could look at all of these things. But maybe for today we can just look at this. At the University of Pennsylvania is a professor named Ram Kanan. Now, Ram Kanan is not a religious man, but Ram Kanan is a man deeply interested in how you make communities better. Kanan founded and leads an organization that's dedicated to seeing to it that those who commit crimes one time don't fall into the trap of then committing crimes multiple times. He's been the president of an organization committed to studying nonprofits and community action and understanding in nonprofit world what works in actually helping different communities. And he was actually one of the pioneers of social work's equivalent of an MD degree. So not a PhD, not the research degree, but the actual doctorate of going out there and practicing social work. In other words, Ram Kanan is a man who has committed his professional life to understanding how you make your world better. And in 2009, as a part of that, Kanan decided he wanted to understand the impact that local churches had in communities. And he wanted to try to put a number to it, to understand if we were to monetize it, what is the actual value of a local church in a community? So he started studying urban churches in Philadelphia. And understand the average size of a church in the United States is about 180 people. The median size is about 70 people. So these aren't all just massive churches. He decides that he's going to look at these churches in Philadelphia. Here's what he came to the conclusion of. He said that when you factor in all the different social services that churches are providing to the community and the way that they add to the, economic, the local economy, he estimated that on average, every year, each individual church contributed $476,663 to their local communities. If you're wondering how that is, this is a picture that actually got created for it, and it involves a number of different things. It's supporting families. It's helping people either get off of drugs or stay off of drugs. It's that when churches work with people, those people show lower rates of criminal activity. It's a whole host of things. But the conclusion that he reached is that local churches are worth every year almost half a million dollars in social services to their local communities. And so if you're looking at your world, your local community, and going, what can I do to help make my world a better place? Make your world a better place by making disciples of Jesus who then come together as the local church and add tremendous value to our local communities. 
And so that's the first thing we can take as we ask this question, how can we make our worlds better? We can look at 3 John and say, we can make our worlds better by making disciples of Jesus. So now that we've got the what, we can move and we can start asking the how question. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to make disciples of Jesus. How are we going to do that? And there's three things we can take from these passages about how you make disciples of Jesus. The first one is by far the least fun, but it's also one of the most consistent shared throughout the entire Bible. And it's this, make disciples of Jesus even when it's costly. Make disciples of Jesus even when it's costly. See, so look at verse nine. In verses five through eight, Gaius has been told, you've, you've supported these men, you're participating in the work of making disciples of Jesus, and that's exactly what you should be doing. But now we read this. John says, I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. Diotrephes has apparently risen to a position of leadership in the local church. John, the human author of this letter, wouldn't have been in that community as one of the first followers of Jesus. He helped lead multiple communities. He wrote to encourage multiple communities. But Diotrephes in his leadership role has, for whatever reason, said we're no longer going to accept the things John sends to us. Which means there's also a very strong chance Diotrephes has said we're no longer going to accept sound teaching. We're not going to hold to what Jesus taught. We're not going to hold to the way of Jesus and new things are going to start coming in. And that's happening. So John says in verse 10, so if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking, I love this phrase, talking wicked nonsense against us. So John says, I'm going to come. Actually, he says, if I come, I'm going to be able to address this. But the implication is he's not there yet. By the time Gaius gets this letter, John hasn't come. And so it's still a situation where the leader of this church is saying, we're not going to interact with them. And on top of that, the second half of verse 10, not content with talking wicked nonsense, he, Diotrephes, refuses to welcome the brothers, these missionaries, these traveling workers supporting the church, and also stops those who want to, and if you write in your Bibles, underline this phrase, and puts them out of the church. This would have been a tremendous loss for people in that church. See, in the early church, if you were somebody who was Jewish, even if you weren't in the early church, if you were somebody who was Jewish, the center of your local community was the local synagogue. That's where your business relations ran through. That's where your family was. That's where your social support was. Participation in the local synagogue was how you were able to participate in your community. And so to be put out of your local synagogue meant that all of a sudden people wouldn't do business with you. It meant that your social support dried up. It meant that all of a sudden you were isolated and you were on your own. And if you weren't Jewish, if you were Greek, or you were Roman, or you were living, you, you're just anything besides Jewish, the same was true for you. You didn't have a synagogue, but for instance, many of the businesses at that time worked through guilds. And you had to be a part of that guild to participate in the business in good standing. It was kind of their version of certification. And often to be a part of those guilds meant that you had to offer sacrifice to the emperor or you had to participate in different worship festivals to other gods. And so for Christians, whether Jewish or non-Jewish, often being a follower of Christ meant they were put out of the synagogue or they were kicked out of their local guilds. They were turned away from their families and it meant that they lost their community. And so the church became the community that they had. That's how you could do business. If you ran into financial issues, that's who supported you. That's who your friends were. That's who your family became. And so when it says at the end of verse 10, excuse me, he's putting people out of the church, understand they've already been put out of the main community. And now they're being put out of the church community. And that means going into a place of severe isolation, socially, financially, emotionally, across the board. And so in that context, as we look at the first half of verse 11, understand what that means because John now writes to Gaius again and he says, Beloved, do not imitate evil. In this context, what is evil? It's doing what Diotrephes is doing. It's talking wicked nonsense. It's not allowing these missionaries to come, not supporting them and putting out those who are supporting them. It says, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. 
Good in this context is what we've already seen praised in verses 5 through 8. It's welcoming these traveling missionaries and thereby participating in God's work to make disciples. And so what's happening in verses 9 through 11 is it's like it's saying this. Gaius, I understand that it has now become very hard and very dangerous for you to welcome these traveling missionaries. But don't give in to what is happening around you. Continue to welcome these missionaries, even if it's costly. You see that in verse 11, when he says, do not imitate evil, but imitate good, he's doing it in a context where imitating good could end up with Gaius being economically, socially, and emotionally isolated from the rest of his community. And so the call here for Gaius and the call for you and I is to make disciples even when it's costly. And it can turn costly. And it can turn costly in explicit ways and it can turn costly in implicit ways. Because explicitly, we know that the Christian message and our society's message about sexuality, about gender, about justice, about finance, about many of these things do not align. And there are more and more places where they're running head on. And those who seek to follow Christ are having to ask the question, am I going to be faithful to my God in this environment, even though doing so may cost me my job, may cost me my promotion? may have me turned out from my family, may have me expelled from my university, may have my scholarship revoked. And those are all realities that faithful followers of Jesus are running into. They may be realities that you are running into. And in those times, God is saying in 3 John, continue to make your world better by making disciples, even when it's costly. So there's the explicit challenge, but there's an implicit challenge as well. Because sometimes the cost isn't that somebody else doesn't like what you're doing and you're suffering in that way for it. Sometimes the cost simply means you have to turn down something good to say yes to what God wants you to do. Sometimes the cost means turning, moving away from where your family is to be where God wants you to be. Sometimes the cost means turning down a job that you would love to have, a career that you would love to have to do what God would have you do. Sometimes the cost means being in places that it's hard for you to be, but it's because that's where you can faithfully minister. When I was in Illinois, when we were at our church, it wasn't doing the best, but there was a young woman there who was incredibly competent. She was leading a young adult ministry, seeing people come to Christ, seeing people become disciples, but she had no business being at that church. And we asked her one time, you know, why are you here? Just, she was a young single woman. There, there weren't other single men there. There weren't a ton of people her age there. Why are you here? And she said to us, you know, it wouldn't have been my choice, but when I came here, I felt like this is where God wanted me to be to lead this kind of ministry. And so she made the choice not to be at some of the different places she could have been that would have been maybe better fits for her, but to be where God wanted her to be. And sometimes that's what it means to make disciples even when it's costly. But sometimes it means you're willing to suffer persecution for it. You're willing to suffer loss. Sometimes it means nobody's coming down on you for it, but you're willing to say no to good things, to be where God wants you to be and to be doing what God wants you to do. And so we've asked, what can we do to make our world better places, to make your world a better place? Make disciples of Jesus. And the first answer to how you do that, you do it by doing it even when it's costly. But then let's look at another way that's in here that, that's tucked away because, see, we've been told again that, well, when we get to verse 12, we're going to come back to 11, but when we come to 12, it's just said, yes, make disciples of Jesus even when it's costly, and now it says Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself, and we also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true, and perhaps we go, well, who in the world is Demetrius? And it seems to be that Demetrius is another traveling missionary. And that's why it's talking about all of this testimony. Because what 3 John is doing as a letter is it was probably a letter carried by Demetrius to give to Gaius as an indication that, hey, John has sent me. You should support me. I'm one of these traveling missionaries. As you support me, you're participating in the work of making disciples. And so what's happening in verse 12 is right after being told this is going to be costly, Gaius is being told again, and here's how you can do it. Here's your opportunity. Here's Demetrius at your doorstep. 
And as you welcome him, you can again participate in the work of making disciples. And welcoming Demetrius would have entailed two things. And these are the other two ways we participate in this work of making our worlds better by making disciples. Number one, it would have entailed hospitality. To welcome Demetrius in would have meant opening Gaius opening his home to Demetrius, saying, come in, you can stay with me, you can share the food at my table, you can share the fellowship at my table. What Demetri or excuse me, what Gaius is being encouraged to do is to share his table with Demetrius. He's being encouraged to practice hospitality. And so, how do you make disciples of Jesus? There's one way. Share your table and practice hospitality. If you are a follower of Jesus, practice it with other people who are followers of Jesus so you can encourage them and they can encourage you. But share it with people who are not followers of Jesus as well so you can get to know them. They can get to know you. And you will have opportunities to share God's word with them, not in a generic way, but in specific ways that they need to hear. And so there's our second way. How do we participate in the work of making disciples? Share your table through hospitality. And if you're going, well, I, I don't even know how to start on that, here's three easy ways to start on it. If you're somebody who's regularly at Bethany, here's your first way. Get to know the name of everybody in your row. See, look around right now. Maybe you already know them. But if you don't, get to know the name of everybody in your row so that you can interact with them and call them by name and begin the process of hospitality. Second step, say yes to an invitation. Say yes to an invitation. See, I know many of you are like this. I'm like this. Our lives are busy. And here in Denver, we all know this. It takes at least 20 minutes to drive anywhere. That just adds to the time, right? And so it's easy to feel like we've got so much to do. And many of you have family here, and you want to spend time with your family. So now you're busy. You're spending time with your family, and you get an invitation to do something, to go to someone's house, to share a meal with someone, and it feels like, I've got so much already, I just want to go home and turn on Netflix. And those are the times where if you want to participate in the work of making disciples, say yes to some of those invitations. Go out to lunch with the person. Go over to that person's house. Let yourself be surprised at how you may actually be energized by receiving hospitality. And then third and finally, extend an invitation. Extend an invitation. I was talking to one of the women in our church here, an incredibly godly woman, and she was telling how in days past, she would get up in the morning and she would prepare a meal for her family, but also for others, not knowing who they would be, and then she would come to church on Sunday with the intent of finding somebody to come eat the extra food. That's the attitude of hospitality. Take that attitude and say, I'm going to find somebody to come to lunch with me afterwards on Sunday. There's a bazillion restaurants within like three miles of this place. Ask somebody to go eat at one of them. Ask somebody to come to your house and share in dinner. If you don't like cooking for people, ask somebody to come to your house for dessert and buy some Oreos and milk and have them over. They'll love it. Nobody's ever been disappointed by Oreos. As long as you get the double stuff. Don't get those thin ones. Then they won't come to your house again. But however you do it, extend an invitation. Practice hospitality, because as you practice hospitality, you are participating in making your world better by making disciples. And so we see that example of practicing hospitality. We see another one as well. Because in verse 12, to welcome Demetrius into his home, Gaius is sharing his blessings with Demetrius. Somebody's still got to pay for the food. Somebody's still got to pay for the clothes. If there's travel involved, somebody's paying for that. In fact, in verse 6 where it says, send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God, that's saying be generous to them so that they have financial resources as they go. And so we participate, Gaius participates in making disciples by practicing hospitality and sharing his table, but he's also going to participate by sharing his blessings. See, Gaius is going to share his table, but Gaius also participates by sharing his blessings. And that's another way that we can participate in making the world a better place by making disciples, is by sharing your blessing. And one way to do that is by sharing your blessings with the local church so that they can be used for the ministry of the church in the community and for missions in the, the city and the country and around the world. 
And so you can participate in God's work of making disciples and making your community better by sharing your blessings through faithful giving to charities, to nonprofits, yes, but God calls one of the duties is through the local church so that the church can lead in ministry to the community. And again, if you're going, well, how do we even get started on that? Here's some simple ways. Number one, if you've never given consistently, aim to give consistently. Say, I'm going to commit to every month, I'm going to give this much and trust that as I give that through the local church, God's going to use that to make disciples and make my community better. Or I'm going to give every other month and you work to give consistently. Now, if you're already giving consistently, then the next step might be to say, I'm going to work to give 10% of my income every month, every two months, whatever your period is. Christians throughout history have found that 10% to be a great number to target to stretch us and to put us in a position where we have to say, God, I'm going to be faithful and I'm going to trust you and I'm going to share my blessings and I'm going to see how you work in me and I'm going to see how you work in the community. And so it may be that you're going, okay, I'm, I'm giving consistently, but now I'm going to try to give at that 10% to stretch myself. Now, some of you are giving at 10%. You're going, what do I do? And if you want to continue to grow in generosity, that's wonderful. And you can do that. And I know some people I've met who have said, I started at 10% and I started saying every year I want to try to increase my giving by 2%. And they've done that. So they'll give, they're giving 20, 22% and they're finding great joy in it. And if that's something you want to do, that's awesome. But maybe you're at a point where you're like, okay, I stretched and I even hit 10%, but just financially, I, I can't go over and above that. And maybe if you, you're going, I want to continue to be generous, then what you do is you say, but I'm going to look to give on special occasions throughout the year. So I'm going to look to give regularly, I'm going to look to give 10%, and I'm going to look to give on special occasions through the year that I know are going to go to meaningful ministry. To give you an example of that, this Thanksgiving, our church celebrated a Thanksgiving offering. There were $7,000 that you gave as a special offering that has gone to Nayan Kunde Hospital in the Democratic Republic of the Congo because they're battling an Ebola outbreak. And it's just hit one of the major cities there. And so they're scrambling, saying, how do we not let this devastate our region, devastate our community? And you who gave to that are a part of God's work to bring healing to those places as you gave generously. And so Gaius is told here, you want to participate in this work of making disciples, you can do that by sharing your blessings. And it's the same for us. We can participate by sharing our blessings. And so we say, how do we participate in that work? We make your, our worlds better by making disciples, even when it's costly, by sharing our tables, and by sharing our blessings. We see all of that, and that leaves us with the final question, which is why? Why do all of this? Why seek to make your world better by making disciples? And the answer comes in verse 11. Because verse 11, we already said, don't imitate evil, but imitate good. And we saw what that means. But then it adds this line. It says, whoever does good is from God. And whoever does evil has not seen God. Now remember who the human author of this. This is John. This is the same John that recorded a conversation where a leader of the religious Jews of, of Israel came to Jesus and Jesus told him, if you want to truly be from God, you must be born again from the Holy Spirit. And so when this says, whoever's from God, this is saying, whoever's born from God is going to do these things, is going to do good, is going to participate in making disciples. And it makes sense if you think about it this way. We expect children to look like their parents. I love seeing some of the different kiddos in our church because we have some, you look at them and you're like, that kid has his mom's hair so hardcore, it's not even funny. Or you look at some and you're like, that guy looks so like his dad, it's the spitting image. Or you go, man, they are so blonde, they are so brunette, and then you look at their parents and you're like, I totally get it. We expect kids to look like their parents. Here's what this is saying. If you're really born from God, if you are really a child of God through faith in Jesus, you should look like God. And one of the most distinct features of God is his commitment to making the world better by making disciples even when it's costly. If you want to see that clearly, just look at Jesus. You know, when Jesus came, he gave 
his mission statement. In Luke 4, he said this. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You could boil all that down to make the world a better place by making disciples. Jesus says, that's his mission. That's why I've come. And he stayed true to that work, even when it put him on a collision course with a cross. And he's murdered, and he's buried, and he's resurrected, and it says a cloud comes, takes him up into heaven, and he's up in heaven. He's overcome the world. He's beaten all of this. He can now say, I'm in heaven. No more thoughts about that place that was so horrible. And instead, what we're told is even in heaven, Jesus prays to make our world a better place. That even in heaven, Jesus ministers to shape and form our world into a better place. Jesus is utterly committed to making the world a better place by making disciples. And what it's saying in verse 11 is that if you are truly born from God, you're going to look like that. If you're truly born from God, you're going to look like Jesus and you're going to have a passion to make your world a better place by making disciples. And so if you are from God and you're hearing this and the Holy Spirit is stirring it up and you're going, yes, I want to do that, let God work in you. Let him lead you to take those opportunities to do it even when it's costly, to share your table and to share your blessings and to join in this work of God as you look like the God who's not just committed to making your world a better place, but who committed himself to making you new, even when it put him on a collision course with the cross. And if you're sitting here and you're going, well, I, I think I'm a Christian, but I'm just not interested and that's never been in my life, then you need to hear the warning of verse 11, whoever does evil has not seen God. And you need to go to God in prayer and ask, God, I, I've thought I was following you. Am I? Am I really truly doing that? Or have I been tricked? And you need to beg God to show you the truth and to speak to you so that you can follow God and be born of God and have assurance of that. And if you've never placed your faith in Christ, the invitation is here to do just that, to place your trust and to look to Jesus as your sole authority because he is the one who came to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight of the blind. He came to make your world a better place. You have the opportunity to trust him and follow him and be a part of doing that with him, even when it's costly. You know, in Hitler's Germany, there was a man named Julius Van Jan who chose to speak up after the crystal knocked, after state-sanctioned violence against the Jewish people. And these are the words that he spoke. And these are the words of a man living what we're reading in 3 John. He said, The truth has been spoken aloud before God and in God's name. Now the world may do to us whatever it wishes. We stand in God's hands. The verses we read today are an invitation to be that kind of person. To say, even when it's costly, the world may do what it wishes, but I will stand in God's hands and make my world better by making disciples of Jesus. Will you join me and praying for God to give us the strength and the leadership to do that as we ask the worship team to come forward. Father, we ask you for strength. We ask you for strength because we see what you are calling us to and we want to do it, and yet we see the potential cost of it and we are tempted to shy away in those moments. We are tempted to turn away from the work that you have laid before us and to seek our own comfort over the care that you provide. God, we confess when we have done that in the past, perhaps some of us have done it this very week, this month, this year, wherever it is, we confess it in our lives. And we ask, Lord, that you would make us the kind of people who can say the world may do to us whatever it wishes because we stand in God's hands and that we would be the kind of people who live out and embody your words here in 3 John as we make our worlds better by making disciples, even when it's costly. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.